before we try to fix the outside world, which I think so many of us try to do on a, on a near constant basis, because it seems so easy from the comfort of our social media profiles, which, you know, the reality is anything but, but I think we got to work on, on the individual, on, on, on who we are when we look in the mirror. And, um, and that's to me what living a genius life is all about. Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. In today's episode, we're talking with Max Lugivier, a dear friend of mine. This is his third time on the podcast. He's been that good. You guys have enjoyed him so much. We have him back talking about his new book, The Genius Life. How to be extraordinary in every avenue of what you're up to, your happiness, your diet, your mental health, your physical health, and so much more. It's a fascinating conversation. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep into the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, functional medicine, and mindset, all with the goal of helping you understand that your brain is not broken. I'm your host, Drew Broyd, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and live more. This week's guest is my dear friend, Max Lugavere. Max is a filmmaker, health and science journalist. He's the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Genius Foods, become smarter, happier, and more productive while protecting your brain for life. Obviously something that this podcast, the listeners of this podcast would be into. He's also the host of the hit iTunes podcast, The Genius Life, which is the title of his new book, book number two, yeah, The Genius number Life. Two. Heal your mind, strengthen your body, and become extraordinary. Max, welcome back to the podcast for the third time. Thank you so much for having me. What a, it's, it's, you're such a good interviewer, you know, and we're such good friends. So this is always, it always tends to be one of my favorite chats. Yeah, but I always you. like to make sure that even though it's a friend, I really do my prep because yeah. sometimes you think you know what they're up to, but until you really do the prep and see and dig into it, you want to ask them things that you never asked them before. Yes. To pull out new sorts of stuff. Obviously, you know that you have a podcast, which... By the way, congratulations. It's been how long now that the Genius Life podcast has been out there? Yeah, about a year and a half. I just thought it was a great opportunity to continue my education, um, getting to reach out and, as you know, create content with other experts, other you know insightful people uh, living amongst us. It's, it's been a great way to uh, continue to grow and to learn and to challenge my, my core beliefs. And yeah, it's been great. I'm just grateful at the, at the audience reception to it. I always love opening books and seeing uh, the dedication section to get a little bit of personal sense of why this person chose who they chose. I had a pretty good idea that you would choose your mom. You did in this new book, The Genius Life, which is the same name as your podcast. You chose your mom. For listeners that haven't heard our past two interviews, I would love to talk about your mom, why you dedicated this book to her, and how her story has been integral in your story and your story and hers. Yeah, I mean, thank you for asking. So, I mean, for those who don't know, I began my career as a journalist. I used to work for Al Gore. He had a TV network called Current TV, which I don't know for anybody listening, it was it was around between the years 2005 uh, and 2011. I did that straight out of college, and when I finished up that that job, which was a dream job for anybody, you know, in their in their early 20s to start, you know, and, and get to really kind of experience the world through the guise of a journalist. Um, I left the job and I was sort of putting my feelers out to see where I might go with my career at the time. And that's when I began spending more and more time in New York City, which is where I'm from and where my mom lived. And, you know, I had done this on camera job for so many years that I really relished the opportunity to spend more time in New York because I was kind of tethered to L.A. Um, for, for the majority of that time. And, you know, I come from a very small family. I'm, I'm very close with my mother. I'm the first born child in the family. And uh, it was around that time in 2011 that my mom started to display the earliest symptoms of what would ultimately be diagnosed as a form of dementia. And my mom was 58 years old at the time. And she was a youthful, blonde, I only say blonde because, you know, I mean, most people think of somebody with dementia as being an old person, somebody with gray right. hair, wrinkles. My mom was a very youthful, charismatic, spirited woman in the prime of her life, really. And I... You know, it was shocking for me and my brothers to witness. I would notice that when I was in the kitchen with my mom and we were cooking something together, for example, which was one of my favorite things to do with my mom, that suddenly it had seemed as if her brain power had downshifted. You know, like we kind of expect the response time in an older adult to be a little bit slower, but certainly not somebody who's in their late 50s. I would cook with my mom and I would ask her to pass something like a spoon or a spice. 
And it would just take her a few extra beats to register and respond to that command. Enough time where it was disconcerting for me and, and those around her. We were like, what's going on with my mom? It, is, it was almost as if she had, a, had suddenly a, a brain transplant with a much older person. And I didn't really think much of it. I mean, honestly, at the time, I thought that it, I was just watching my mom get older. But it was on a family trip to Miami when she openly announced to the family that she was having memory problems and that she had sought the help of a neurologist. And that had that caught us all completely off guard. And actually, we were so... We were, we were in such disbelief that my mom could be having real symptoms that we actually patronized her. And it was, it's one of the things that I, I regret most. You know, we, we didn't believe her. So my dad asked my mom, if you're having memory problems, like what, what year is it? Tell us the year. And my mom couldn't tell us the year. And me and my brothers were in such disbelief that we kind of prodded at her. And we were like, come on, mom, how can you not know the year? We were like making fun of her almost. And she broke down and started to cry. And that for me was the moment that everything changed. I basically realized at that point that I had to move back from LA to New York permanently to go with my mom to different doctor's appointments and try, to try to get to the root of what was what was happening with her. And ultimately, her symptoms uh, indicated that there was a neurocognitive disorder, um, you know, underneath the, the presentation of symptoms that we were seeing, but then she also had concurrent movement symptoms. So the most common, the most well, well-known movement disorder is Parkinson's disease, which is the second most common neurodegenerative condition. Many people are familiar with uh, Michael J. Fox, for example. He's the most well-known guy with, with Parkinson's disease. Ultimately, uh, my mom was diagnosed with a, a rare form of dementia called Lewy body dementia, which for anybody who hasn't heard of it, it's sort of like having Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease at the same time. And it was just a terrible situation. I mean, in every doctor's appoint, in every doctor's office, I experienced what I have come to call diagnose and adios. You know, normally what a doctor will do is, you know, prescribe a drug or tweak the dose of a drug that, that you know, the patient is already on. But generally these drugs are ineffective Um, with the exception being Cinemet, which, you know, tends to provide symptomatic relief for patients with Parkinson's disease, but that's not so much the case for patients with Lewy body dementia, which actually has more in common with Parkinson's disease than it does Alzheimer's disease. But patients tend to respond less well to Cinemet with that condition. Um, And it has no disease modifying effect. It's purely, uh, you know, like a biochemical band-aid. It improves symptoms. Um, and it just left me disillusioned, you know, somebody who's always been a fan of medicine uh, and, and really kind of like looks up to medicine in the way that I think most people do. I was just shocked at the paucity of viable treatment options for my mom. And and so, you know, her it was just years that that, you know, we were slowly watching her get worse and worse and worse. And and that sets you on a journey. Yeah. Which we've talked about quite extensively, yes. both on a personal, we had you on the podcast to talk about your personal brand and personal journey and how you do all that and incorporate into your work and the story of your mom. Mm-hmm. And also in our first interview, so listeners who want to go deep into that, mm-hmm. you know, we definitely do, but pick us up from the point of after that. Yeah. And what happened from there? Yeah. So with all of my learnings, I wrote Genius Foods, which was my first book, and that was a book that was sort of a nutritional care manual to the to the brain. And soon after I wrote Genius Foods, um, I realized that nutrition is just one part of the puzzle of what it means to have a healthy, optimally functioning brain today. And so I seized the opportunity to then, uh, basically I wrote a proposal for a second book, a, a lifestyle guide that's going to incorporate the latest research and you know a more evolved view on nutrition, but also the myriad of other ways that diet and lifestyle um, can affect brain health and brain function. And it was three months after I got the deal to write my new book, The Genius Life, um, that something really terrible happened uh, with my mom's health. I was um, in LA uh, for work. It was Labor Day, 2018. And I got a call from my brother. I was with my mom just a few days prior in New York. We had a doctor's appointment. My mom's cognition had seemed to have taken a, a, a more marked downward turn and she had no appetite. But went to a doctor's office with her just a few days prior 
frustratingly unremarkable, you know, just as like any other doctor's visit that I'd been to with my mom, it was just really hard to get a sense of, you know, what was going on. Turns out that while I was in LA, my mom had turned yellow. Mm. And, uh, you know, a person can turn yellow. Um, one way would be, you know, consuming too much beta carotene and your skin turns, you know, sort of an orange hue. But another way that your skin would turn yellow is if you become jaundiced and that's the, the whites of your eyes also take on that hue. And that's actually what happened to my mom. She had become jaundiced. And that can happen for a number of reasons. Probably the most common is somebody has a gallstone and that causes bilirubin, which is the pigment that gives stool its color to back up into the blood. It seeps into the skin, into the whites of the eyes. And usually they go in and they, and they, and they remove the stone. But they were just about to give my mom an MRI of her abdomen and uh, I hung up the phone with my brother and I got the first flight I could from LA back to New York and I immediately went to the emergency room. I was anxious the whole way home and uh, they had just, they were, we were, as soon as I arrived, I think we were just, we were minutes away from getting the results of the MRI. They hadn't yet delivered it to my family. And it turns out that what they had found was not a gallstone, but in fact a tumor on the head of my mom's pancreas, and it was pressing into her bile duct, obstructing the flow of this of this pigment, and that's what had caused her to become jaundiced. So it turns out she had pancreatic cancer, and like the vast majority of cases of pancreatic cancer, by the time at which they had diagnosed it, that Labor Day weekend, there was already evidence of metastasis, meaning it had already seemingly spread to her liver and um, and it was just it was just awful I mean from that moment they you know my mom was put on hospice and they projected about three months three to six months was the window and uh, three months to the day almost um, she passed away and so yeah it was awful it was, and it was a, it was just a harsh reminder of all those sort of diagnose and adios experiences back when my mom was first diagnosed with a neurodegenerative condition, because there was nothing that that medicine could offer my mom, with you know, in terms of the treatment of her cancer either. And you know, I've expressed my condolences to you privately, and this is the first time we're talking about it on air. You know, again, expressing my condolences, like how challenging that is. My grandfather had dementia. It's a whole other thing when it's a parent of yours, you know, grandparent, it's still challenging, but not as challenging as a parent. And just all the things that come along with that, then he ended up getting cancer of like the mouth and had like a big hole in his cheek. And just, it's so challenging for the person, for the family. So my heart goes out to you and your brothers and your dad and everybody who went through that. And really, you know, the first book to connect it into that if i could connect it back to your mom's story and the legacy of what you wanted to talk about you had already signed a book deal and thought to continue this work and still flying back and forth i remember i'd see you all the time going back and forth between here and new york sure. hey can you hang out this weekend oh, i'm gonna go see my mom or spend time with my mom which i just thought as somebody who's so close to his parents it's such a beautiful thing what did it mean now, like besides your own personal grieving process, what did it mean now for the work in your life and what it stood for? Well, I mean, it just sort of cemented that, you know, tr under tr just trying to understand why this happened to my mom, what ultimately was the, the cause, you know, that, that could be to blame for the fact that my mom was stolen from me has become my life's mission and purpose. And I'll never know exactly what the, what the reason was for my mom having developed these two health, you know, monstrosities, dementia and then cancer, the two most feared conditions among, you know, human beings. Um, but certainly what it made me realize is that the modern, the modern world has become toxic in myriad ways. And I, you know, I can't, point my finger in any one direction. You know, if you look at the food supply, the food supply has become uh, mangled by any number of industrial processes. Um, you know, we're inundated on a daily basis with chemicals that disrupt the way that our hormones function. And I'm not just afraid of all chemicals or saying that, you know, that, that anything that we can't pronounce is worthy of, of skepticism necessarily. But, um, but 
you know, there had to have been something that changed in between my mother's generation and my grandmother's because my grandmother on my maternal side lived to 96 and she was healthy until the end. So she lived a very long time. She had a very long health span. And my mom, who obviously has a huge genetic overlap with her mother, was so sick and so frail. And so it's led me to wonder whether or not my mom was sort of the canary in the coal mine for the Western way of life. And that's, those are kind of the ideas that I explore in, in the genius life, is looking at all the different ways in which the modern world is putting our bodies under assault on a near constant basis. I mean, I talk in the book about endocrine disrupting chemicals and heavy metals and other compounds that are in the environment that are worthy of, uh, of criticism. And if you look historically, I mean, there are so many instances where a newfangled product, whether it's a supplement or a medicine or um, some kind of industrial chemical has been foisted into the, you know, into the marketplace only later to be realized as having disastrous consequences. I mean, it's lead-based paint. It's asbestos in our building ins in insulation, environment-destroying pesticides. And so, you know, my mom was sort of like at the receiving end of, um, I think, much of where this has sort of occurred throughout history because she didn't really make much of an effort to learn about health and nutrition and healthy living. She was just your average person. Yeah, who was being marketed to that these things are safe. It's yeah. all about convenience, the chemical revolution. Yeah. Plastics will make us better, exactly. healthier, make our lives e easier, especially for women who traditionally, especially in like, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, mm -hmm. the ones that are primarily taking care of the household. And that layered on top of another very important idea that you talk about in your first book and in your podcast and guests to this podcast have talked about is that when you discuss uh, diagnose and adios, it's like maybe there isn't one root or one thing that caused your mom to have which, have, which one of the disease you want to pick. Maybe it was a bunch of things that were there. And often those things, the first sign of them can be traced back years prior to the diagnosis of us heading down the pathway. Yeah, I think it's the overall, I like to call it the burden of toxicity. You know, I mean, it's not just the food. It's, it's you know, it's the food layered on top of the, you know, polluted air that we breathe, layer, layered on top of the chronic exposure to ambient noise pollution, which we know is related in many ways to metabolic health, like, you know, levels of inflammation and things, and p even potentially heart disease because of its effect on, on stress levels. It's heavy metal overexposure. It's the exposure to compounds like phthalates and BPA, you know, which are these plastic compounds that you mentioned. Um, and the body is adept at defending itself against one or maybe a few of these kinds of insults, but you just, you, you layer it one on top of another and it, it overwhelms our body's defense forces. And so I think that that probably plays a role. I mean, when you look at stress, there's this concept, and I actually became enamored with this idea, and I write about it in the book, of allostatic load. So your body, your body exists in a state of homeostasis, balance. And whenever you get thrust out of balance, the steps that your body needs to take to regain that sense of balance, balance is called allostasis. And we all have a sort of a, a maximal capacity you know, of, of stimuli that we can respond to before it becomes, before you take allostatic load, which is the sum number of things that our bodies need to contend with, and it becomes allostatic overload. And allostatic overload leads to burnout. It leads to feeling overly stressed out, and it leads to illness and disease. And so I think that it's probably um, not a stretch of the imagination to, stay, to say that many of us are living in a state of, of allostatic overload. And, um, and I think it's a problem, you know, whether it's chronic stress, you know, people not sleeping uh, as much as they ought to. The fact that our diets now are 60% comprised of what we call ultra processed foods, um, grain and seed oils, which we know are toxic to the brain, or I should say certain grain and seed oils are toxic uh, to the brain and over reliance on refined carbohydrates and, and grain products. Um, it all sort of adds up. So you can't really point a finger in any one direction because these kinds of conditions that we're talking about, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, they're multifactorial conditions. But I think when you take them all in aggregate and you throw them at your average person who's not really exercising, who's eating kind of a suboptimal diet, who's stressed out and not getting enough sleep, then what you get is dis-ease. Whenever you're writing a book, at least I've heard from my friends like you who have written books, yeah. 
part of it is that it's your own exploration of seeing. You know, you wrote the first book, Genius Foods. You were talking about that. But there was other aspects of your lifestyle that you were paying attention to and becoming more aware because we have access to the information in a way that the generation prior to us, your mom's generation, my parents' generation, they didn't. They couldn't ask why. They couldn't easily look up information. They had a library and even then a limited resource of books. Just it was not as accessible. What's one example of one of these factors in life, these multifactorial things that was there that even you yourself, being somebody who was pretty deep into the space, found out and became clear of in the process of writing this book? I think the, the just the exposure, well, I guess one thing that I talk about in the book, which is going to probably make people uh, avoid drinking out of plastic water bottles, um, is the fact that, you know, compounds that are in these plastic um, products are not inert. So whether it's BPA or it's chemically similar sibling BPS or BPF, which, you know, manufacturers are now starting to replace BPA with just because consumers have become aware of BPA. But there's no reason to, to expect them to be any safer. In fact, uh, an expert that I interviewed on the topic used this really elegant um, phrase that I thought was actually kind of funny. It's become sort of like a chemical game of whack-a-mole, you know, where yeah. as soon as consumers become aware of like BPA, industry rushes to replace BPA with other compounds, and there's no reason to, to believe that they're safe. In fact, they're even more treacherous because there's less testing usually done on them. Um, but anyway, these compounds like BPA, one of the reasons why I think people need to be more aware of them is that they act in the body like hormones, essentially. BPA has, BPA has been known for almost a decade now to possess estrogenic properties in the body. It's known as a xenoestrogen. And it's um, certain cancers are related to having too much estrogen in the body. For example, breast cancer. Not all of them. Not all cancers. But my mom was diagnosed with a breast cancer that was estrogen based. It was a HER2 positive. She had the gene, and then it was an estrogen based cancer. And a thousand percent, the doctors that worked with her reassembled a team said, in addition to you having this gene the other estrogens in your life. And we used to always carry things in plastic and other exposures that she had and just drinking regular milk that has like hormones back in the day. Uh, 100% was one of the contributors that was part of it. Yeah. I mean, if you buy a plastic water bottle that's in there, I mean, so heat catalyzes the leaching of BPA into, into food or fluid. Um, but if you buy a water bottle and it's been sitting in the refrigerated section of the supermarket, there's no reason to believe that that water bottle has been always refrigerated. In fact, most, uh, most likely it's been sitting in a truck's heated bed, you know, for months, if not, you know, weeks, if not months. Or and a so, warehouse. Yeah, or a warehouse or what have you. So uh, it's, it's made me very uh, conscientious of, you know, avoiding plastic um, related compounds. And certainly... The other thing that I that I try to achieve in the book, and I and I hope I've done a good job, is not to not to unnecessarily fearmonger. You know, I think it's impossible to avoid all of these chemicals. So, I mean, the, the strategy that I advocate in the book is to minimize your exposure to these compounds and to also facilitate your body's own detoxification of them. And so, there are a few ways to do that, which we can talk about. But um, with most uh, toxins that we'll encounter in the environment, there is this notion that the dose makes the poison, and that what that essentially means is that with an increasing dose, there's increasing toxicity, there's increasing danger. Um, but what's so uh, treacherous about these endocrine disrupting compounds is that many of them can be expected to follow uh, what's called um, a non-monotonic dose response. So whereas if you take a compound like arsenic, you know, you might actually be okay if there's trace amounts of arsenic in your diet. Anybody who consumes brown rice is consuming, you know, a significant quantity of arsenic, but not enough to be overtly toxic. The problem with these endocrine disrupting compounds is that you might have uh, an overtly toxic effect at a high dose, and then not much of an effect at a moderate dose, and then at a low dose effect, it starts to become biologically active in the body. So it's more like a U-shaped toxicity curve instead of a linear toxicity curve. Um, and what that means is that it's given these, these chemicals, essentially, or the implication is that it's allowed these chemicals to subvert not only scientific scrutiny, because they're so hard to test and therefore predict the effect that they might have in one's body, but it's allowed them to sort of dodge scrutiny from the standpoint of policy uh, and, and you know, the regulation of industry. And so 
I think it's what, what's an example of like one of those chemicals that you came across that could fit in that U shape. So anything that you know, the Endocrine Disruption Exchange, which is an amazing, it's a it's a organization that I recommend people just be aware of. They're out to raise awareness for the fourteen hundred. Uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals that they've sort of highlighted as being present in the environment that a person could be exposed to on a day-to-day basis. Um, some of them include parabens, which are found in our cosmetics. They're also found in some foods that are used to prevent the growth of microorganisms. If you look on your food um, ingredients list or on your cosmetics, anything ending with paraben is going to be a paraben compound. And those have been suspected to possess endocrine disrupting effects. Um, parabens have also been found in the tumors of breast, you know, breast tumors. And that's not to say that they, that they necessarily caused those tumors, but the fact that they can affect the way that our hormones function and are also found in those tumors, I think is a red flag. Um, so you want to avoid parabens in your cosmetics, um, especially because there are now so many great options in our drug stores that are paraben free. Uh, phthalates are another good example. Phthalates are related to BPA and the fact that they're both plasticizing compounds. Paraben, uh, phthalates are usually there to make plastic soft, and BPA makes plastics hard. So you'll find BPA in, I don't know, plastic furniture, CDs, CD cases, DVDs, um, and also water bottles. And you'll find phthalates in things like fragrances. Yeah. Because they'll take the, fra- the molecule that actually gives a smell they'll wrap it in a phthalate to preserve it in the air. So if a fragrance has longer longevity, it just means it hangs out in the air longer. Well, how do they do that? They coat it in a phthalate. Yeah, 100%. So you want to avoid phthalates. And I think the easiest way to do that, aside from avoiding plastics, as you mentioned, is to avoid fragranced um, products. So whether that's dish soap, whether that's laundry soap, hand soap, face wash, um, cosmetics, Anything with a synthetic fragrance. Usually it'll just say fragrances. Um, and that's not to say that it can't have a pleasing smell. You want to opt for things that are that are fragranced with essential oils, generally, which don't have parabens, essentially. If they're, if they're plant or fruit-based oils, then they're usually going to be phthalate-free. Um, or I said parabens before. I meant phthalates. Uh, so so qu- follow-up question for you. Yeah. So I was asking about one area that in the discovery, you know, like you knew about plastic water bottles and how they're not like the best and that sort of thing after doing some of the research, because it's always the balance of like, okay, you don't want to fear monger, but we really know these things do have an effect in our lives. So on a personal level, after you dug into it, what have been some of the implications? Like you just don't buy plastic bottle bottles anymore. Like what are some things you were doing before that you don't do anymore? anymore? Yeah. Well, I mean, this was, this all became um, front and center in terms of my consciousness because my mom was inundated on a constant basis with, um, home cleaning products that my mom's home health aides uh, used to essentially sterilize her house on, yeah. a, on a near consistent basis. And they were not aware of any of the stuff. And certainly I was not as aware of uh, how dangerous they can potentially be. And so my mom was confronted with these kinds of chemicals on a near constant basis. Um, and certainly any, anytime my mom was in a hospital or anything like that, I mean, they're using these kinds of, these kinds of chemicals. Um, in my own personal life, yeah, I've stopped buying anything with artificial fragrances. And now when I drink uh, any kind of beverage, with the exception of when I'm desperate for something to drink, yeah. you know, like if I'm traveling and I don't have any other option, I'll buy, you know, I'm human, I'll buy a plastic, you know, water bottle. But for the most sure. part, I'm drinking out of um, glass and I'm doing things that help facilitate my body's uh, excretion of these compounds, which I think not many people are doing. On, at the end of the day. Many, I mean, these compounds, some of them uh, don't linger in the body very long. You just have to give your body a chance to excrete them, um, which is the case for BPA and, and phthalates. Other compounds like per and polyfluorinated alkyl, poly and per fluoral alkylated substances or PFAS substances actually can linger in the body for much longer. Um, and so, you know, they compounds like that become more treacherous. Those are um, used to make products waterproof. For example, PFOA, which is a compound um, used to create Teflon. Those actually, those are like, they've been called forever compounds because they linger in the body for years, if not decades. Crazy story. Just this past week, there's an article about a startup that is making period-proof underwear and how part of the way that they make the underwear, like stain-proof and other things like that, is 
the researchers were saying that they could have coated it with these uh, these um, uh, PFOAs. Mm-hmm. And there's a little bit of a debate between the company and the researchers of is it in it, is it not in it. But one of the interesting things is the the that women's uh, lady parts <laughs> are highly absorbent. They're designed to be absorbent and that sort of thing. They soak it in. So you have those chemicals touching that region of the body. They can quickly bypass uh, what would typically be the way that we would digest or ingest things through our mouth mm-hmm. and get directly absorbed right into the system. Just another example of how wary everybody has to be about these chemicals in all aspects of our life. Yeah, I mean, the approach that I take is that these these kinds of compounds and, and you know miracle formulas that you know pop up on the market and you know we're just supposed to embrace that they're that they're somehow going to be benign for our health we should consider them guilty until proven innocent. You know, I think for the justice system, innocent until proven guilty is, you know, it's an amazing, it's it's essential. Uh, but I think too frequently we assume that these kinds of creations are going to be, um, you know, similar. And I think that the burden of proof should be on them to prove that they are safe. And oftentimes that's not what you get. Um, especially for compounds like this, the reason why they don't necessarily have the kind of, sc- they don't fall under the same kind of, testing and regulatory scrutiny that a drug or or a supplement or a food product might is because we're not expected to ingest them. But nonetheless, many of these compounds enter our bodies. um, And as I mentioned, you know, only later are determined to have potentially disastrous uh, consequences. I mean, you can look at sunblocks, for example. I mean, you put a sun, we slather our children in sunblocks every summer. Right. Well, recently it was discovered that these sunblocks not only are able to enter circulation, but they do so at a level far higher than the FDA's threshold for toxicological concern. So and quickly within five minutes and quickly they enter the bloodstream and you can see it when you're taking blood on somebody and quickly and chemical sunblocks that are found in, you know, nearly every drugstore sunblock that you purchase oxybenzone, avobenzone, they possess endocrine disrupting um, abilities. And as I mentioned, or perhaps I haven't yet, uh, you know, gotten to this, but hormones guide everything in your body from sexual function to brain function to your predilection for fat storage and fat gain to appetite to energy regulation. I mean, it's just, you know, hormones are everything and they become even more important when you're when you're a child when you're developing because any fluctuation in hormones at that age especially when under the influence of you know external uh, influence um, can have potentially lifelong effects because hormones guide development they guide you know the development of our sex organs they guide you know brain development and so you know it's just crazy that now we have to look at these you know with these these sunblocks with a with a with the eye of scrutiny, and the fact that they've been on the market for so freaking long before this has actually been done, you know, we we required, you know, a fairly simple test um, before now. Suddenly, manufacturers are being asked by the FDA to prove that they're safe, and yet they're still on the market. Um, so it's just a, uh, it's just crazy to me, like how far we've we've sort of been able to come as a society, um, and yet not really kind of give do the due diligence that I think many of these chemicals are deserving of, especially when we're, we're in, when we're confronted with them on a near, on a nearly day to day basis. In fact, many of them we've been exposed to for the entirety of our lives. I know Dr. Hyman has talked about the fact that the environmental group has, uh, has identified 287 chemicals in utero that babies are exposed to in the womb. And these are not just like, you know, chemicals that are endogenous to the human body. These are like industrial chemicals that are released in the burning of coal, garbage. They're clearly, they have clear links to neurotoxicity, to cancer, to development problems. Um, And so I just think we need to do like a lot better in terms of um, demanding more from our regulators uh, and and voting with our wallets and avoiding these kinds of compounds and, and ultimately arming ourselves with the knowledge. That's it. And supporting nonprofits that are out there like EWG, who yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. You find them at EWG.org, who are actually putting in the work and putting out the studies, researching things. They have their database. If you want to find a healthy sunscreen, they have their top recommendations on there. It's called Skin Deep. You can go on their website. So supporting the people to do the work and especially empowering yourself. 
So I'm going to come back to the first chapter of the book is don't fork around. Yeah. <laughs> you got some cheeky chapter titles in this new book that's here. So the last book was primarily about food. Most of it was about food and the foods that support brain health and, uh, and really living your best. After writing an entire book on that, what did you want to put in, especially when it came to the opening and talk about food that you didn't get a chance to talk about before? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I think that I'm, I'm probably biased toward nutrition because, you know, I just, I happen to love the field of nutrition and I consider myself a big nutrition nerd. Um, but there, I think, were some, some key points that um, were not made in Genius Foods that I wanted to make in the Genius Life, especially in regard to metabolic health and body composition. So Genius Foods is really all about the prevention of dementia and what we know about that given the, given the best available evidence. Um, but I think many of the kinds of conditions that we're now seeing burden society, um, you know, the kinds of chronic non-communicable diseases that, um, that are now robbing us, you know, 60% of people according to the World Health Organization die because of, you know, any one of these, these kinds of conditions are intricately related to body composition. So having a strong, healthy, relatively lean body, I think, becomes crucially important. 40% of cancers are related, at least, are related to um, being overweight or obese. And today, when you look around, statistically, most people are either overweight or obese and struggling with some kind of insulin resistance, whether it's full-blown type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes. Um, so chapter one really is sort of like the key takeaways that you need to know in terms of using your diet to look better naked, feel better, and you know ultimately achieve a healthier body composition and to reduce levels of inflammation with food. So I think one of the uh, points that I make in this book that I didn't make in Genius Foods in regard to nutrition specifically is that you really ought to prioritize protein. So protein is a super powerful tool that we can use to satiate our hunger um, drive ourselves towards a, a, a more optimal body composition with greater lean mass, less body fat. Um, and there's also an interesting connection between protein consumption and brain health. Uh, so protein, you know, for those who don't know, we've got three primary macronutrients. There's fat, carbs, and protein. Protein is found in eggs, um, chicken, fatty fish, grass-fed beef. There's this idea it's been coined the protein leverage hypothesis that our hunger is driven primarily by our requirement for amino acids. Because if you think about it, protein makes up the entirety of the body. So aside from the fact that our muscles are made of protein, essentially, and muscles are important for mobility, you know, being able to navigate the world, procure food, procure mate, these all rely, all these behaviors rely on protein. Protein also is the backbone of our neurotransmitters, um, you know, messenger chemicals in the brain like serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. They, it also makes up um, amino, uh, it makes up um, enzymes in the body and also collagen. Collagen, I believe one third of bodily protein, if not more, is made up of collagen, which is sort of like the glue that holds the body together. It's also important for healthy, supple skin and the like. Um, Anti-aging, keeping inflammation at bay. And so by prioritizing protein, people actually tend to consume less carbs and fat. And you can do this at every meal by basically, you know, making sure that your plate is half full at least with some kind of properly sourced uh, form of protein. And it's also important to remember that not all proteins are created equal. So you have um, most people today are consuming muscle meat essentially. So if you're eating like a steak or a chicken breast, um, those are great options, but they are concentrated in a part, they have a particular amino acid profile that unless you're balancing that out with collagen, um, or specifically, uh, an amino acid found in collagen called glycine that actually might negatively affect your health. So I sort of take a, a, a nose to tail approach with my, in regard to my recommendation to consume more protein, um, and, uh, and to integrate foods like bone broth, um, you know, collagenous tissue, organ meats, and things like that. And if you can't, or if you don't like, you know, those foods, then I make the recommendation for a, a, a collagen supplement, which could be inexpensive. And I have no affiliation with any collagen manufacturers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's crucially important. I think when it comes to building and maintaining lean mass, which becomes increasingly important as we get older, 
um, especially in view of the fact that, you know, we tend to lose um, hormones as we get older that help facilitate the growing and maintaining of lean mass. And, and muscle is important to prevent falls, to, as I mentioned, remain mobile, to be able to exercise, to continue to continue to do the things that we love to do. Not to mention the fact that having muscle, more muscle in your body is important for hormone function, insulin sens- sensitivity, and things like that. The research is now coming out showing us that the RDA, which is 0.8 um, grams of protein per kilogram of lean mass, is actually sub, you know, suboptimal from the standpoint of maintaining uh, lean mass as we get as we get older. So the recommendation that I make is actually double that: is 1.6 grams per kilogram of of lean mass. Interestingly enough, and you know, they they talk about like the blue zones, and there's like different theories and thoughts of. Like, oh, the blue zones eat, don't eat as much protein as we yeah. do. Or like, you know, this one in California is vegetarian. And we had Dr. Gabrielle Lyon who came on the podcast a few months ago. And she was saying how what the research ten- seems to support is that actually when you're less active, you sometimes need more protein. In these societies that are a lot more active, you have the rice farmer who's out in the fields every day, squatting, picking things up, lifting heavy things that are there. That's one way that they're continuing to strengthen that muscle mass in the body. And maybe they don't have access to the same amount of high quality proteins that we might have over here, but they're able to maintain that lean muscular body because they have more movement inside of there. And then sometimes in societies where they don't, this is just her theory and thoughts Mm -hmm. on it. Love to get your opinion on it. And especially as we get older, when we start losing a lot of that mass, it's that much more important to eat adequate amounts of protein to support the body. Yeah. I mean, there's this idea that eating low protein somehow is going to facilitate longevity. But in my view, I mean, based on my, on my interpretation of the literature, I mean, that's a recipe for disaster. Um, you're going to basically, it's a recipe for sarcopenia, which I think many people struggle with. And, you know, frailty is like such a, awful thing to have to contend with when we're old. And it's something really that you tend to only see in the Western world. I mean, if you look at these blue zones, like you mentioned, uh, they're not frail, you know, they're, they, I mean, granted nutrition isn't the only variable that distinguishes them from us, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I think when you look at these longevity studies that are being done, like the fasting mimicking diet, um, you know, which is, been coined over at USC by Walter Longo and, you know, studies in, in smaller organisms where they've really looked at calorie restriction as a, uh, means to extend lifespan. It's hard to, they are also on protein restricted diets, but it's hard to tease out whether the benefits that they, that they see in terms of lifespan comes from the protein restriction or the calorie restriction. And I'm inclined to believe that it's from the calorie restriction, not necessarily the protein restriction. And especially when you add protein to a, you know, to a lifestyle that embraces, um, physical activity, like weightlifting, resistance training, which I think everybody ought to do. Um, I think it's pretty likely that the benefits of, you know, that higher level of protein consumption are going to outweigh any potential risks, especially when the protein comes from properly raised animal sources. Um, and you know, what I mean by that is wild fish, grass fed beef and things like that. Um, I just don't think that protein restriction has been demonstrated in humans to have any kind of a positive benefit. And I think the inverse has actually been true. That older adults who are on a a resistance training regimen that actually increase their protein beyond the the recommended daily intake for protein um, seem to not only get stronger, uh, but, you know, there's also a relationship between protein consumption and uh, less amyloid aggregate in the brain. So amyloid is this protein that forms the backbone of the plaques that are associated with Alzheimer's disease and cognitive aging more generally. Um, but there was one study that I found that I detail in the book that showed that among older adults, higher protein consumption was related to less amyloid, uh, in the brain, um, which was a stark finding. And it's, you can't really say whether or not it was the protein itself that led to this, uh, reduction in amyloid or the fact that, you know, when you eat more protein, as I mentioned, you tend to eat less potentially prone, pro-inflammatory foods like carbs and fat, which kind of typify junk foods. Um, but I see no downside to, you know, to, to eating, you know, higher protein. I'm not talking about going crazy necessarily. Um, 
but I think a practical double, level, like on a practical level for a guy your size, you're like six yeah, two. I try to consume. I'm six one. Six yeah. one. So I try to get, um, in terms of pounds, because you know we're most of us are in the U.S. and so we don't go by kilograms. I try to get 0.7 grams of protein per pound of lean mass. If I were overweight, when I make that calculation, I would use my goal weight to determine how many grams of protein I should get per day. It's generally 0.7 grams per pound of lean mass. Um, that I think is a good sort of benchmark uh, for most people. And as I mentioned, protein is, su is super satiating. So, I mean, if you just kind of run a little thought experiment for yourself, when was the last time you've overconsumed chicken breast or fish? It's not something that's bound to happen. But if I ask you when the last time was that you overconsumed fat and carbs, you know, I'm sure it's a lot easier to, to recall when that may have been. I mean, that's like ice cream. That's like, you know, any number of packaged processed foods that, you know, you see in the aisles of your supermarket. But Pro high protein foods are largely self limiting, and so it's actually pretty difficult to overconsume uh, protein. And I'll make the caveat that you know people with existing kidney disease, it might be prudent to watch your protein intake. I'm not a medical doctor, so you know I don't know about specific uh, medical conditions. But generally speaking, for general health and wellness, um, and having a more optimal body composition, I think it's probably better to prioritize protein. So another thing you emphasize in the book is that it's not just what we eat, it's when we eat it. Yeah. And you talk about that. Bring up some of the topics you shared in the book uh, on the podcast here. Yeah. So, I mean, circadian biology, it's like this amazing field of research that we're just, you know, the story is still being written, certainly, but I wanted to pay homage to it because I think it's so fascinating. It's this notion that when we eat might be as important as what we eat. And I still think what we eat is 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 probably most important. Um, so for people that don't have a choice in terms of, you know, when it is that they get to eat, uh, you know, I still think that, you know, if you're able to make healthier choices for your diet, then that's like going to be 80 to 90% of the, of, um, you know, of getting you there in terms of like better health. But uh, there is this, this, you know, this burgeoning line of research that's showing us that you know, we, our bodies tend to be, and the hormonal milieu of our bodies tends to be oriented in a way during the day that supports metabolism, digestion, um, energy utilization and storage and things like that. And so, you know, when it comes to higher carbohydrate foods, for example, I think it's important to eat those primarily during the day, which is when we're at our most insulin sensitive. And insulin is the hormone that basically shuttles glucose or sugar in the blood into your muscle tissue and your liver. Um, and our bodies are most efficient at doing that earlier in the day. In fact, there's this uh, notion of afternoon diabetes. Ten, people tend to get less insulin sensitive uh, as the day wanes. Now, does that mean that if you eat like a sweet potato late at night that it's going to somehow cause you to gain weight or um, develop type 2 diabetes? No. But in terms of, um, you know, keeping our blood sugar at an optimal level, I think um, it's probably – important to consume denser sources of starches and carbs earlier in the day. Also, late later on in the evening, digestion slows down. Peristalsis slows, which is the transition, the transit of uh, contents from our stomachs um, through the digestive tract. And so there's this notion that um, the kitchen kind of like closes uh, later on in the day and that we want to, um, you know, maybe curtail our eating to about 7, 8 p.m. every night. And there have been a number of studies, um, I think mostly in men, which is unfortunate, uh, you know, so it's hard to generalize, but that early time restricted feeding, so eating a dinner earlier in the day and then not eating after that, um, has a number of potential benefits in terms of, you know, optimizing blood sugar, blood pressure, and these are all independent of weight. So it's not necessarily that early time restricted eating is just another means of calorie control. It seems that um, that by not eating too late at night, we actually can see metabolic benefits, lower blood pressure, um, lower blood sugar, and things like that. So it's all, uh, it's, it's super interesting. And, um, you know, I, I go to great lengths in the book to sort of detail where the current state of the science is. Um, but it is fascinating. So a lot of people are interested in intermittent fasting and things like that. And so the recommendation that I make in the book is, is basically not to eat for an hour or two after you wake up and to not eat for two to three hours before you go to sleep, just to sort of make it, you know, really 
sort of easy for people. Yeah, and for people who have experimented, sometimes they want to take it up to the next level for them personally, and level is so relative. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of individuals who might do two meals a day instead of one. Um, in general, do you do, how many meals a day do you have and incorporate on like a normal weekday? Yeah, I do two meals a day. Um, for the most part, it's the meal that I break my fast with and I'll eat that around noon every day. And I don't count calories or anything like that. I eat until I'm full. Um, and that first meal is usually gonna be a healthy dose of protein. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I'm prioritizing protein at every meal and a heaping portion of vegetables, whether that's dark leafy greens in the form of a salad. I'm a big fan of the big fatty salad every day, which Rush University research shows us is associated with reduced brain aging by up to 11 years. So sometimes I'm you know, just eating a big salad or roasted vegetables. You know, I think it's important to incorporate a range of, of fresh produce, whether it's cooked or raw. Um, and then I'll kind of do a similar thing for my last meal of the day. And then I try not to snack all that much, but um, I'm not opposed to it, especially when those snacks um, are highly satiating, high protein snacks. So sometimes I'll go for a low sugar beef jerky, um, a handful of nuts. Uh, I'm a huge fan of seasonal fruit, so I'm not, you know, I'm not afraid of fruit or anything like that. Um, but nutrient density is something that I think is crucially important. And I know that there's this movement now towards OMAD or one meal a day, uh, which I'm not a subscriber to. I think, you know, when you're, when you're eating one meal a day, it's got to be really difficult to, you know, get all the nutrients that your body requires for good health. And so I think it's probably a, a more attainable ideal um, with two meals a day plus a few snacks. And so. Yeah. And I've mentioned this before, but it's good for, pe for people to experiment. Like I love doing two meals a day but I feel much better when I eat first thing in the morning. Hmm. I usually eat first thing in the morning and then I might go do some training. And I always remember growing up, my parents' fasting was like baked into our religion and, and, this, and the Indian tradition. They would always fast in the evening. They wouldn't fast in the morning. They hmm. would skip dinner. That was often the most common way that they would do stuff. I remember talking to uh, Walter Longo's team about it and they were saying, you know, throughout the world, most people fast later in the day. They don't skip actually breakfast because especially the healthy fats and proteins are required for our brain to function. So depending on the type of activities that you're doing that day, you may want to play with it a little bit because everybody's different. I know being a CEO of a company with 60 employees and running around and I have a lot of meetings in the morning, my brain does not work as well if I don't eat anything in the morning. So I do better when I eat in the morning and then I'll often either skip lunch or I might skip dinner. Uh, which is better for me. But again, back to people experimenting and trying stuff to see what does best for them. Yeah, the one the one sort of caveat that I would that I would add, I mean, I think it's fine to eat first thing in the morning, but it depends totally on your sleep quality, how many hours a night you're getting per, you know, for sleep. Um, because some people, if they wake up, if they go to bed late, for example, and they wake up artificially due to an alarm clock, there's a good chance that their melatonin, which is you know elevated when we sleep, has not fully subsided. So melatonin is supposed to be at its like you know nadir. It's like its lowest levels when you wake up first thing in the morning, um, which is you know for those who don't know, melatonin is the body's sleep hormone. It's also involved in cancer protection, gene regulation. So it's you know it's one of these. Uh, one of you know countless chemicals in the body which doesn't have just a singular job you know most 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 uh, enzymes proteins in the body they have side hustles melatonin is a good example of that um, but most people who wake up artificially early do an alarm clock their melatonin levels have not fully come down yet and so they're still groggy in the morning and melatonin actually has the effect of making you less insulin sensitive. And so if you are waking up at an ungodly hour every day to get to your work, you know, I mean, God bless you, but eating a high carb breakfast during that hormonal milieu is probably not going to be in your best interests. Now, is eating first thing in the morning inherently bad? No, especially if you wake up naturally. You know, as I mentioned, we're diurnal creatures. And so, um, and so we are meant to eat our food during the day. You know, we're not like mice, but, uh, but I think you just want to make sure that you've fully woken up before you reach for that for that you know first meal. And if you um, do wake up you know early due to an alarm clock and you haven't yet fully woken up, I would just prioritize protein, um, as I mentioned, and uh, fiber. You know if that's possible to make yourself like a scramble with vegetables. 
Um, the worst meal that you could possibly have is like the standard American version of the of, of a breakfast, which is very high in carbohydrates, usually consisting of like the bran muffin and a glass of juice and the coffee with sugar and cream. I mean, that would be all like, the things that spike your blood sugar. Yeah. And head you down a downward spiral for the rest of the day for like hunger. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think I do best like right around. So I generally wake up at like five forty five six. I like to eat around like seven and again everybody's different yeah. and the way their bodies are built what i also notice is that with you talking earlier about our metabolism slowing down later on the day i think one thing that a lot of people agree on is that a big heavy dinner that a lot of people are used to which is tough to break when it comes to being social with people or going out on dates or other things like that is not always optimal because if you eat a big heavy meal your biggest meal in the evening it can affect your sleep and other aspects of your health. Yeah. And, you know, your body is not as adept at partitioning nutrients later on in the day with the other caveat being. So, I mean, you know, I like to underscore the fact that there's no one size fits all diet. And so all the guidelines that like I give and I write about, I try to always um, give the caveats to people because everybody, as you mentioned, everybody's different and everybody has a different lifestyle. So, and you should know both sides yeah. because a big part of it is actually a little bit of experimentation. hundred percent. hundred percent. So continue, please. You were saying. Yeah. So, I mean, where, where I won't typically recommend, um, you know, eating starches and carbs, you know, from grains, for example, uh, later on in the evening, if you're a late exerciser, for example, um, which I think many people are due to their work schedules, if you are getting to the gym at 4 p.m. or 5 p.m., then you're basically sort of artificially inducing insulin sensitivity um, by having that workout later on in the evening. And so for you, eating carbs at you know in the evening is not going to be a big deal because when we exercise, we have the benefit of this really powerful um, mechanism called insulin-independent glucose uptake. And so your muscles essentially become a, a, a sponge for carbs and sugar. And so you can get away with having more carbs later on in the day. If you're working out in the morning, for example, um, you know, and you're going to eat your, and if you have one meal of day, one meal over the course of the day, that's going to have your, you know, whether it's like a baked potato or, you know, pick your carb of choice, um, then it's probably, it's a great idea to have it, you know, during the day at that point, And then to not eat, you know, many carbs later on, like in the evening. So, yeah. And just like you were saying, a lot of the studies that were done on fasting have been done mostly on men. Yeah. The other caveat that's there that a lot of functional medicine doctors talk about, if you're a woman, if you're ovulating, trying to get pregnant, if you are in that space where, you know, you really just want to think is fasting even something that you really need to be doing right now and just listening more intuitively to your body and focusing on that. Because if it's saying it's hungry, you know, it might be for specific reasons. So not all advice beats for all genders at the different times that are there for them. So I want to pivot from that conversation to I'm going to pick a part of the book that I feel like is really crucial. And you uh, did a lot of really great uh, writing to highlight it. And you devoted a lot of attention to it, which is vitamin D. Yeah, there's quite a big section of the book. There is yeah, about vitamin <laughs> D. And so give us the 40,000 foot view of how you came to understand the crucial role that vitamin D plays in our health. Yeah, vitamin D, when it comes to the brain, it's crucially important. There was a really great review of environmental risk factors for the development of, for the development of dementia. And vitamin D was the top um, risk that they highlighted as being crucial to correcting um, if you want your brain to be in optimal health. And I think that, uh, you know, the science is evolving, but it seems that Vitamin D is a steroid hormone that's involved in the expression of nearly a thousand genes in the body. So that's 5% of the human genome. And there are vitamin D receptors inside every cell in every organ of your body. Um, vitamin D is also the only uh, nutraceutical that has a strong body of evidence um, for the potential treatment of MS, multiple sclerosis. You know, high dose, they're looking at high dose of vitamin D for uh, symptom alleviation in patients with MS. So there's all this like really interesting research out there. And I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that vitamin D is important for helping normalize levels of inflammation in the body. Um, it's really important for having healthy blood pressure and, um, and, uh, arterial flexibility, which is crucial. And I think most people underappreciate the role of cardiovascular health in brain health, but the brain is fed blood and nutrients and fuel by a vascular bed 
that if you were to take out of your head and stack these little, um, you know, capillaries end to end would stretch 400 miles long. And vascular dysfunction is one of the earliest preceding uh, things to go wrong, essentially, um, in people with Alzheimer's disease and even mild cognitive impairment. And then, of course, there's va vascular dementia, which is the second most common form of dementia, which is sort of a more um, accelerated form of dysfunction of these these of this vasculature. And so, yeah, so I think getting, you know, healthy, making sure that your levels of vitamin D are healthy. Um, and I think it even starts there because so many people, even who have health insurance, they'll sometimes send over their labs to say like, oh, what else should we get, you know? And I'll send it over to like one of the doctors at our clinic. And I know enough to know some of the basics of like what they should be asking for. And so often they'll have years of blood work and nobody ch check their vitamin D. Yeah. And that in itself is first even just asking and having a conversation with your doctor to make sure that those things are included. It's not always included by default. I think there's a lot more awareness now, but for a long time I would see a ton of blood work from friends and other people and it didn't have vitamin D and it's such a cheap and easy test to add. Yeah, I, I, there's a, a very large meta-analysis that I, that I detail in the book and I forget the journal that it was published in, but basically what they found is that the pe people had the, in this very large population had the lowest um, risk of all-cause mortality when they reached a vitamin D level in their blood of between 40 and 60 nanograms per milliliter. And there have been other studies that have found that right around 50, which is like dead center in that range, also was able to confer sort of the, the highest level of cognitive uh, improvement. So, you know, all that being said, there is no consensus in terms of what the optimal vitamin D level is, but that's sort of a range that I think is important to shoot for. Um, and, uh, and another thing that I think most people don't realize, and this was pretty surprising as I was writing the book, I found out that the enzymes that convert the form of vitamin D that your skin creates via its exposure to the UVB rays of the sun, it needs to be, to be converted into the active steroid hormone that then can influence your brain and you know all, the, uh, all of the other organs in your body that it does. These enzymes, magnesium is a cofactor in them, and 50% of the population doesn't consume adequate magnesium. And so if you're not getting adequate magnesium in your diet, or if you're, and if you're not supplementing with it, then there's a good chance that you could be getting all the vitamin D that you need from the sun necessarily, but it's not gonna be reflected in your blood levels, and it's not gonna be having all the health benefits that's associated with having optimal uh, vitamin D levels. The other thing that's important is that people have varying um, abilities to synthesize vitamin D. So when you're uh, old, you know, when you're older, your skin is not as efficient at creating vitamin D as it is when you are younger. If you are overweight, your fat tissue, because vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, can sequester vitamin D the same way that it does for all other fat soluble vitamins. Um, so you can actually be getting enough vitamin D in terms of your exposure to the sun, but again, it's not going to be coming up on those levels. If you live in a northern latitude, if it's, you know, the time, if it's winter and, you know, the vitamin D rays that are able to reach the sun's, the, the earth's surface um, are diminished, then you're not going to be getting um, adequate levels of vitamin D. And so... Thankfully, our bodies have an ability to store vitamin D. We store it in our fat tissue. Um, and then also we get vitamin D from animal products. So when we eat egg yolks, when we eat fatty fish, I mean, we're, we're able to sort of make it through the winter uh, from, from the standpoint of our diet. But I think that getting adequate sun exposure and making sure that our magnesium levels are topped off uh, by eating foods that are high in magnesium, which we know are very good for us, um, crucial in terms, of, in terms of getting all of the benefits that vitamin D is thought to uh, impart. And when it comes to something like that, do you regularly check? Like, do you go like once a year and get your blood work done and things? Like, how do you navigate yeah. the side of, you know what? I'm not sure if I have enough vitamin D. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, thankfully, it's a very easy blood test that any doctor can run. Um, it's also inexpensive. Uh, and so, yeah, once a year I go and I get my levels tested. And if you're not in the optimal range, it's very easy to bring those levels up. I'm a fan of the supplementation um, of vitamin D. Uh, there was another study that I found. Um, it was basically a research calculation that found that most people, with by for most people, uh, supplementing with 2,000 international units of vitamin D3 every day is enough generally to bring people up to that level. Um, but again, if you are overweight, you might need more than that. So there's no one-size-fits-all recommendation here, but it's crucial to make sure that you're getting sun and the other thing that I'll add that I talk about in that in that section that you're referring to is that um, 
the benefits of sun exposure can't be limited to the UVB rays so that we can create vitamin D. There's also thinking that the UVA rays from the sun help create nitric oxide in our blood vessels, which helps to boost blood flow, enhance endothelial function. So, I mean, there might be benefit from the UVA rays from the sun. And then that's not to mention the fact that the sun light, we're talking about circadian biology, helps anchor our body's circadian clocks. So the light from the sun is crucially important for a number of reasons. It helps, it helps our brains create serotonin, which is the feel-good neurotransmitter, but it's also involved in healthy executive function. So getting good sun first thing in the morning um, is crucial. And if you could do that in a way that sort of, you know, kills multiple birds with one stone, I mean, that's, that's a great strategy for, strategy for better health. Why did you include a section, a chapter in the book called Peace of Mind? What was inspiration and what did you want to teach people with this chapter? I just think mental health is so crucially important and it's something that many of us struggle with. And so I kind of wanted to um, give people a 30,000 foot guidebook, a roadmap in terms of how to navigate the modern world in a way that um, supports mental health as opposed to takes away from it. Because we live in a time where, you know, not every toxin is something that we necessarily eat or ingest or are slathering on our skin or breathe in. You know, I mean, you can consider an addiction to social media a form of toxicity. You know, I mean, we have people that are paid lots and lots of money to make sure that we're staying addicted to our devices. And I'm, you know, as much on social media as anybody else these days. But I think it's important to become mindful of these aspects of modern life that don't always act in the best interest of our mental health. I also, in that chapter, I detailed some of the really exciting research now coming out on the use of medicines like psilocybin mushrooms um, that have been studied at uh, Johns Hopkins and NYU and how they're finding that, you know, just going out of your mind temporarily and having a, a mystical experience, occasioning a spiritual or mystical experience can actually have profound and, and, um, long lasting effects on our mental health. Um, so I think that that's a really cool line of research and then work. I go into work and the fact that so many of us are now strung out and burnt out and, you know, working jobs that we hate when we should all be striving to, to basically have vocations, which are jobs that we, that, that don't feel like jobs essentially. And I know it's not, um, easy for every person to achieve, but I give some tips there as well. Um, having interviewed people that are experts in the field of innovation and sort of looking at the commonalities between people who have really stepped outside of the moving uh, walkway that's pulling us all into these, seemingly pulling us all towards the rat race um, and job security and staying within our comfort zones to look at like what living a genius life might be for somebody who doesn't want to, you know, work a nine to five for somebody else. Um, and so I talk about that, how talking, how, you know, finding a noble aim in your life uh, is, can be really powerful. Um, you know, it's something that I know that you've found, something that I've certainly found um, in my- And that we're finding. That we're right? finding, Like we're yeah. in the process of. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's You don't a have it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out, but it's like the constant- Exactly, On exactly. the base foundation. And, you know, as I think so many people look up to you, and this is why I so loved that you came on the podcast and you did your story. And what you shared about like the behind the scenes, if you want to go back and listen to it, we'll link it to in the show notes for yeah. anybody who's on the I'm listening to the podcast right now. You talk about the evolution of just continuously just showing up and giving it a shot and doing your best and bringing the best to the world that you have. And that will continue to, to, to grow. hundred percent. I think that's, you know, when you, when you have an idealized goal, a noble aim as psychologist Jordan Peterson calls it, I think, you know, Living in the modern world isn't easy um, by any stretch. I mean, this is something that's become, you know, really important, uh, an important message for me to drive home is that, you know, life is hard, like no matter how privileged we each are. And, you know, I like to acknowledge that I'm like, I, you know, if you look under the dictionary of the word privilege, like I'm there, I'm, I was born, you know, male, I'm six foot one, I'm white, I was born in New York, like I you know, I have it so much easier than I think the vast majority of people. And yet all of us, we have to see our loved ones decay and get decrepit and age and ultimately pass away. And it's just tragic. You know, I'm like, I'm, I've always been so deeply touched by the suffering of others. 
And that's why I feel like I've dedicated my life to this idea of service, to helping other people not have to go through what I had to see my mom go through. And so no matter how, you know, no, no matter who you are, that's why I have empathy for everybody, you know, across political divides, across, you know, race, anything like that. I mean, it's just life is just this, this struggle. And no matter who you see, no matter who you look at, um, whether or not you perceive them as being somehow, you know, standing on, on more solid ground than you, they're dealing with stuff in their own lives as well. Everybody is at the end of the day. And so, um, and so I, I think what I try to do with The Genius Life is to give people tools to kind of to, to, to see that, to acknowledge that, and to, um, you know, on the one hand, be kinder to themselves. Uh, because I think a lot of people, you know, today in the social media world, we tend, to, we, we tend to be very quick to judge ourselves, especially when we look at the social media feeds of other people that tend to be hyper curated in these like fake portrayals, um, but also to project that kind kindness outwards. I mean... This book, in many ways, I tried to, in, in that chapter, um, especially, I have a whole section where I talk about some of the teachings that my mom imparted on me. And being kind and being truthful and honest um, was core to who she was. And, um, and that's something that I hope to you know, impart on my readers. And it's going to do a world for not just your mental health, but the mental health of others. You know, there's this idea, one of my favorite philosophers, Jiddu Krishnamurti, um, said famously that you are the world. And I think that like before we try to fix the outside world, which I think so many of us try to do on a, on a near constant basis because it seems so easy from the comfort of our social media profiles, which, you know, the reality is anything but. But I think we got to work on on the individual, on, on, on who we are when we look in the mirror. And, um, and that's to me what living a genius life is all about. And that's what I try to impart my readers with. On the topic of mental health and... You share the story. We started off the podcast with the story. You talk about your mom, how that led to the work of you wanting to support her, her decline, and ultimately the loss that you and your family faced. When you're in that moment, moment of loss and grief, what were some of the things that you did and to surround yourself with? Um, again, everybody will lose somebody in their lifestyle in their lifetime. You had just lost your mom. How did you? support yourself through the process of getting through that? I mean, it was, it was so hard. I was it's tons of crying and reaching out to my friends and thankfully having friends who proactively like you reached out to me. Um, there's really no guidebook. You know, I don't think that we deal, we, we deal very well with death, especially in this culture. You know, I think that they have a, a perhaps healthier way of, 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 dealing with it around, you know, in other parts of the world. But generally, like I think in the U.S., you know, especially for younger people, we all kind of have this like idea of immortality. And that's like enabled certainly by like pop culture and everything. And um, there was just no precedent for me and no no guidebook. And so watching my mom get so sick was it was the hardest thing that I'd ever experienced. And it was barbaric in many ways it was inhuman and um and yeah i mean i don't think i don't think people should have to go through with that honestly like I, I, if there was an if if i were in her shoes and there was an eject button you know i would probably press that button because you know especially in the in the in the last few weeks if not days of, you know, dying from cancer. I mean, it's painful. Um, you know, it's, it's just like, it's terrible. So I'm really lucky in that I've been, I've made, I made the decision to be public with my, with my journey. And so this, the, you know, I like to hate on social media, but actually having a social media account where, you know, a lot of people follow me and, were 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 kind of going through this with me. I'm so grateful for the for the countless messages that I got from people all around the world that were there with me, and and many of whom have experienced similar things, you know, with their loved ones. So that was great. But um, but ultimately, no, it was terrible. It was awful. I still get pain pangs. They're like they're almost like hunger pangs. You know, you don't really expect them, but you know, I'll be doing something 
or I'll, you know, hear something that reminds me of my mom and it'll just be like a pain, you know, be like a sharp pain in the gut. And, um, and it reminds me of just how awful what she went through was, you know? And, uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, I love her more than anything. And, and to have seen somebody who you love so much go through that and be, to be so helpless, um, yeah, it's just terrible. So that's why prevention and helping, you know, helping kind of shepherd people towards a healthier life has, you know, is, is so important to me because, um, you know, health is the most important thing that there is really. There's like this saying, I forget who said it, but it's like, you know, a healthy person has a thousand dreams. A sick person only has one dream. And it's not just the sick person who has just one dream, but it's the it's the people who are around that sick sick person. Um, all the success, whatever, like you know, the fact that Genius Foods did really well, you know, having written a second book. I mean, I would give it all back in a second to have my mom back, and to and to have her well, like all of it. I would, you know, if if you if I if there was a genie in a bottle and he said we can give you your mom back, but you're gonna have to work a nine to five job, you know, like a desk job for the rest of your life, I'd probably, you know, I I'd consider that for sure, because it's a, uh, you know, like the suffering and the trauma was just unbearable, and so, yeah, I don't wish I wouldn't wish that what she went through onto like my worst enemy. Well, I look at your life. And I look at you so actively keeping her legacy alive and that being a big driver through the work and the mission of you both being here, writing a second book, being out there in the world, sharing with empathy, sharing with compassion and understanding, with always including the multiple viewpoints that are out there, breaking things down in a way for people to understand, talking as if, you know, the Dalai Lama has like a quote, it's like, you know, meet everyone as if it's like your mother. Right? Yeah, wow. It's a very Buddhist quote. And I feel like, in a way, I always try to imagine, like, teach everybody as if you're talking to, you know, your mom. Like, yeah. how would you explain to your mom? When you're not frustrated and you're yeah. like, mom, come on, like, just do this thing. When you're not frustrated and you have compassion and you're sitting there and you want to sit down in a compassionate way, you want to talk, you want to explain it. Like, how would you do that for your mom? Like, do that to the world. You know, be there for them. And I see you keeping your mom's legacy alive in the work that you do. And... I just want to commend you as somebody who's so close to my parents and my mom I had shared earlier was came to me in a moment where she was really scared and I just got diagnosed with breast can breast cancer was not yet ready to share with the family only my dad knew and was uncertain of what it meant and we had a few other family members that had breast cancer and some that were still doing okay some that had rapidly de rapidly declined and just being in that moment that the person that brought you into the world is in this such a vulnerable position mm -hmm. it just puts everything into context and i can remember just dropping everything and trying to figure out like how do i support her thankfully knock on wood it was early we caught early there's an incredible team to support her every cancer is different everybody's different in that and she's healthy she's here and i still always remember back to that moment even in like little moments when i have my tiny tiniest little frustrations yeah as we, we all, all do we all have them yeah and just thinking about like how lucky i am to be in this situation and then one day my mom my dad the rest of the people in my life i to others i will transition i will pass on i'll move there so just understanding that life is so precious it's so short here so what do we really want to dedicate ourselves to and i see you dedicating yourself to the legacy, prevention, helping other people. And I just want to commend you for that, for doing great work in the world. Thank you, dude. So are you. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying, you know. I mean, we each have just this limited time on earth. And, uh, you know, I have like a certain skill set. And, um, you know, I didn't, I grew up loving health and medicine. And, and you know, I thought that I was going to go into med, you know, do the medical route, go into med school, be a doctor. I didn't end up taking that route. Um, but you know, my life path, my journey, um, you know, has come sort of full circle. And, uh, you know, the fact that I'm able to 
be an example for people and to and to unearth this research and to present it in a way that might draw people in that wouldn't otherwise you know make these kinds of choices or or improvements i should say in their diets in their lifestyles um, means to me that what my mom went through wasn't totally in vain and uh you know because i wouldn't be on this path if not for her i would be yeah. doing something else and we talked about that in your in your previous show but um but yeah, I mean, the fact that, that my mom is there and that, that she's motivated everything, it's what keeps me honest. And um, and yeah, and I'm just grateful that I've been able to help, you know, a few people along the way. Well, you'll continue helping people with the next book. Congratulations, The Genius Life, it's out there. Same name as the podcast. We'll get to the podcast in a second. Um, people can pre-order it. Uh, you haven't actually, at the time that we're recording this, it's a little bit ahead of when the podcast actually is officially out. But for those that are listening right now, the book is out. You can pre-order it. Are you going to do a fun pre-order campaign like some of the goodies that you had with your other book that was out there? Yeah, we got, uh, if you pre-order it, if you go to the website, geniuslifebook.com, we've got some goodies if you pre-order it. Yeah, you can get a guide to hacking restaurants and supermarkets. I also have a... Uh, it's a free PDF guide. I also have a guide to understanding science. So like how to read research and things like that, which I think is an important skill set for anybody to have. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's it. So we got some good bonuses and, um, and then, you know, aside from that, I'm putting out content for free all the time on, on my Instagram, but yeah, pick up the genius life. I'm super proud of the book and, uh, the way that I describe it, it's like the little changes that you can make in your day to day countless of them but they're all going to add up to have big health wins over the short term but you're going to feel them immediately um, today so whether that's you know achieving a healthier weight or you know getting more fit um, or better digestion these are all you know topics and areas that are covered in the book with sort of little lifestyle hacks so i think you know hopefully it resonates i love it and the podcast would love you to give think back on 2019 three episodes that were very meaningful to you that if our listeners are not a listener of your podcast yet, two, two or three episodes that were really meaningful to you, they don't necessarily have to be about the topics that we talked about here that you might want to share with our listeners that we can link up in the show notes. Yeah. Wow. Well, they're, they're a little bit different, but one of my favorite podcast episodes that I did um, over the past year, one was with a PhD named Sarah Hill, who talked all about uh, birth control. And I discovered that, you know, birth control actually can change a woman's brain to the point that she is attracted to a different kind of person when she's on birth control than she is when she's not on birth control. And so she shocked me with the with the revelation that women who are on birth control when they initiate a relationship and then they go off birth control when they're in that relationship, there's this high rate of like of breakups and divorce because women realize that they're not actually as into the guy that you know as they were when they when they met them because they were on birth control at the time which is crazy we yeah. had a doctor on the show dr afruz de mary she's a nat naturopathic doctor at uh, university of irvine at their center for integrative medicine she said that happened to me i was on birth control i was with the wrong dude <laughs> i got off birth control and i just you know she talks about this openly in the interview so i'm not showing anything that she didn't share she said then I just didn't like his smell and that maybe that's the pheromones. Maybe that was everything else and other things that were there. And I was like, how did I end up with this guy? So it's true. That's insane. Yeah, it's insane. So that's one. That's one. Yeah. I most recently had um, David Perlmutter, who's a mutual friend of ours on the show. And I thought that was a really great interview. I always have a good chemistry with him, yeah. you know, when, when he's on the show because of our shared, you know, love of brain health. And um, we also have sort of a shared, um, history in the sense that we both have had a parent uh, pass do well or with dementia I should say his dad yeah. his father passed from Alzheimer's disease a, a couple of years ago um, so I enjoyed having him on that was a great show and he talked all about his his book um, and then another one these are all in in recent memory so I'm not you know good at recalling you know some of the episodes from earlier in the year but I've also had Chris Kresser on Chris Kresser is a very smart guy. Um, he's sort of been in the public 
the, the zeitgeist recently because of a number of Joe Rogan show appearances that he was on where he was debating um, the merits of the vegan documentary Game Changers. And, uh, you know, I'm a Chris Kresser fan. I think he's a really smart guy. And so, love the dude. Yeah, I love the dude. Very, very thoughtful, soft-spoken. Like you also, always giving both sides of things. Yeah. You know, I remember an article that he wrote where he was saying, you know, look, dairy, these are the reasons why dairy might not be great. But also some of the research around dairy and osteoporosis, it's actually for certain societies, it might actually be okay. I think we kind of got it wrong. That doesn't mean that dairy is a health food and that everybody should be on it. But it doesn't mean that everybody needs to demonize it. I just thought, wow, how beautifully written of both sides. I am very reactive to dairy, so I choose to avoid it in my life. But just a level-headed dude. Yeah, level-headed, thoughtful, non-confrontational. I think that's sort of where he, I mean, this is going a little off topic, but he kind of got thrown into this world of like debating the merits of this documentary on the Joe Rogan podcast and, you know, lots of testosterone in that environment. Like, you know, he was debating one of the producers of the film who's like literally a a fighter in real life. And so you put Chris up against that and it didn't, that debate didn't, necessarily go very well for Chris but nonetheless I think most people who can see through the fanfare and the aggression of a you know of of somebody with a more combative personality saw that Chris actually you know basically won the debate he was he was much quieter but um but anyway yeah so I think he's I think he's a great guy and so I like to I like to have on my podcast people from all different backgrounds you know I don't I'm not exclusionary I don't just have on PhDs and MDs because you know, I mean, I, I myself am an example of somebody who, you know, under the right circumstances has really dedicated his life to learning about this stuff and to sharing it. And there are other people like me out there. So um, so I like to kind of have all viewpoints on the show and um, have fun with it. Some of my episodes are more, you know, funny. Some are more informational. But, uh, but it's a good time. I mean, launching it is one of, you know, the greatest things I think I've ever done. Like, I just love the conversations that I get to have. It's fun. Got to have you on there. Yeah, definitely. Maybe we talk about friendship or something. Yeah. <laughs> the Genius Life Podcast, link to it in the show notes. Definitely get the book. Many of our listeners got your first book. Super excited about that. There's a new book to build on. It's out there. Heal your mind, strengthen your body, and become extraordinary. Max, thanks for being on the podcast and being extraordinary. Always a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Drew. Our friendship means a lot to me, so thanks for having me. Absolutely.